and welcome back to the Thinking Progressive Weekly Progress Report, perspective and news progressives can use. I'm your host, Ron Rivers. It's November 1st, 2019, and today we're going to be discussing the revival of the Civilian Conservation Corps, the tragedy of Katie Hill, uh, the decline of Christianity in the United States, and the latest technology news. So diving in, the Bernie Sanders Green New Deal is is the most progressive piece of legislation we've seen since the original New Deal, although I'd argue that it currently holds the title. The bill is nothing short of systemic reformation, a new direction and agenda that will have ripple effects for decades to come. It is the most clear path to really a genuine combating of the climate crisis. And today I want to talk about Bernie's plan to reinstate the Civilian Conservation Corps, or the Triple C for short. Before we dive into Bernie's plan, I do want to take a moment to talk about the history of the Triple C and its impact on America. So the Civilian Conservation Corps was a voluntary public work relief program. It was in operation from 1933 to 1942 uh, in the United States, and it was for unemployed and unmarried men. Originally, young men uh, ages 18 to 25 were the primary target, um, but it was eventually expanded to ages 17 to 28. And the Triple C was a major part of President Franklin D. Roosevelt's New Deal uh, that provided manual labor jobs related to the conservation and development of natural resources in rural lands, uh, typically owned by like the federal, state, or local governments. The Triple C was designed to provide jobs for young men and, and really relieve families who had difficulty finding jobs from the Great Depression Um, Now, through the course of its nine years of operation, three million young men participated in the Triple C, which provided them with shelter, clothing, food, and with a wage of about 30 bucks a month, which would roughly be about 280 bucks today, maybe a little bit more. Now, historically, their work had focused on structural improvements like bridges. They used to build fire lookout towers and service buildings, transportation, um, like carving out uh, roads. Uh, minor roads, large roads, foot trails in parks and airport landing fields, erosion control, they would like be in charge of dams, uh, terraforming, vegetable covering, flood control, so they they were involved in uh, irrigation matters, draining, uh, ditches and dams, forest culture, so they planted more than 3.5 billion trees and shrubs, and were also involved in seed collection and nursery work, which by the way, the, these efforts still are responsible for more than half of the reforestation done in our nation's history. Um, so really impressive. They were all about forest protection, uh, preventing firefighters, fire suppression, uh, firefighting, and insect and disease control, and, and a whole other, you know, there's a, a, actually a longer list of items, I, and I'm going through a lot of them, but I'll link it below so you can check out the full details. And, but to give you an idea of, of who was enrolling back in 1993, of the enrollees were from rural communities, um, and a majority of which were actually non-farm. 45% came from urban areas. So it was a nice mix, right? It was a real uh, culture exchange. Now, 38% of them had less than eight years of school. 48% did not complete high school, and 11%, only 11% had graduated high school. So at the time of entry, 70% of the enrollees were actually malnourished and poorly clothed with most having you know, little work experience beyond occasional odd jobs. It just goes to show you who this program was developed to help. You know, it, was, it was made to address a genuine crisis of employment and you know, self-worth and activity and productivity in the United States at, at these times. Now, on his website, Bernie outlines a plan to reinstate the Civilian Conservation Corps and reshape it for present day. He proposes an investment of $171 billion to reauthorize and expand the Triple C to provide good paying jobs, to build green energy infrastructure, plant billions of trees and other native species, um, to work on flood and soil erosion, essentially address the the impacts of climate change, uh, rebuild wetlands and coral, cleaning up plastic pollution, and constructing and maintaining accessible paths, trails, and fire breaks, um, as well as working to rehabilitate and remove abandoned structures. In many respects, it seems like Bernie's kind of taking the best parts of this Triple C pass and and kind of updating them to solve modern problems. The focus on our environment is especially relevant now that it's public knowledge, you know, really the extent of the crisis we face. It's just every, you know, scientists aren't aren't exaggerating when they they say it's going to happen much sooner than we're giving it credit for. The, The impacts have really already happened. Now it's just about damage mitigation. Um, and it's, 
You know, I think one of the, the most profound impacts, and I kind of hinted at this earlier, will be to give the poor rural and urban youth the opportunity to kind of escape their situation. You know, in doing so, we can connect them and network them with others from diverse backgrounds and perspectives. Ultimately, like, you know, the hope is that this effort breaks down some of the artificial barriers created by our inherited identities, right? It's an opportunity for people who would typically find themselves deep within, for example, Trump's base, to expand their horizons and reduce their fear of the other. Uh, the same is true for urban residents who'd be given a chance to connect with people experiencing a shared but different struggle. I want to kind of add in my own personal spin and, and spend some time diving into why I love the concept of a revitalized civilian course beyond the immediate. So for centuries, the United States military has relied on poor and uneducated people to fill its ranks, right? The rank and file soldiers who get sent to war at the orders of the wealthy elites who are elected to Congress, really bought into Congress. Now, it's no secret that for many of our most economically disenfranchised communities, the military is seen as a way out. And that's not a bad thing, right? It's a pathway to skills and employment. And there is an aura of respect for many, a culture that puts the needs of the majority over their own um, deserves respect. I think that's a huge part of the, about the military is the, the brotherhood aspect of it, right? And I say that as a, gen, you know, a gender neutral term. But even with these positives, there's, there's still conflict, right? The, the military industrial complex that really is the United States of America is, is quickly losing favor among millennials and Gen Z. And in reflection has really proven to be an unsuccessful strategy for the expansion of what you know, are commonly known as West Westphalian values free speech, de democratic elections, uh, freedom from corruption, freedom from persecution um, that's unlawful or politically motivated. What we see today is that technology, uh, economic strategy, and political expertise have really proven to be more effective weapons than bombs and missiles and guns in the battle for global supremacy in the 21st century. Uh, China and Russia, right, who are arguably our two most significant threats to global democracy, have gained significant ground during Donald Trump's presidency. Both countries are, are pretty thoroughly isolated against any sort of militaristic intervention because they're armed enough to ensure mutually guaranteed destruction. And today, our might is concentrated in the Middle East, attempting to make sense of a disastrous 18-year war with really no end in sight. While that's happening, right, our drones are slaughtering civilians regularly, premature endings to the lives of children who have no less value than any American baby sentenced to death simply because of their birth lottery. The BBC reports that PTSD is on the rise among our soldiers as well, providing a scenario where not only are we unable to accomplish our objectives, but our service members are being irreparably damaged in the process. Now, this isn't to say that the military doesn't have its benefits. It certainly does, right? It provides structure, culture, and identity to those who seek it. And educational and healthcare costs are greatly mitigated for soldiers allowing for a significant opportunity after service. What I have always found most attractive about the military is the discipline and culture of, of mission adherence, to be a part of something larger than oneself. You know, I, I ended up choosing a path where I went and got a, a dual major at a private university, which left me with $120,000 of student debt at, at the age of 22. But in another universe, I could imagine myself enjoying the challenge of the military, despite my strong disagreements with their current trajectory. Now that's where the Civilian Conservation Corps come in. This is an opportunity to take the best aspects of the military, the, really the camaraderie, the discipline, and the skill building, and apply them to nonviolent actions in the service of the nation. Having a pathway for youth who are really not ready or interested in seeking higher education to develop structure and skill is an incredible boon to society. But more importantly, the Triple C addresses something lacking in American culture today, which is a deep sense of empathy. By providing youth a way to interact and connect with others from different experience and perspective, we lower the barriers of fear of the unknown, laying a generational foundation of protection against the ignorance fueling the rising white nationalist movement in our country. Now, Bernie's plan is voluntary, and I think he's going to have a lot of volunteers. But something we should consider as progressives is mandatory social service. Progressives across the nation have to grapple with the fact that social ideals, such as like greater equality uh, of opportunity, of wealth, Medicare for all, education and criminal justice reform, among others, are not supported or aligned with a consumerist consciousness. 
the pathway for democracy moving forward is to instill a greater sense of solidarity among the nation. And it's a fine line. We don't want to be China and exercise an authoritarian kind of top-down form of soul craft where we dictate what you can think, but we do need to break ourselves free from the capitalist ideals of every person for themselves. Every individual in a progressive democracy has two core responsibilities to the world, right? They have a responsibility to themselves to, to maximize their individual potential and access and agency within society, but they also have a responsibility to society. We can't hope to continue the momentum of transformation without tying an aspect of civil society into our national soul craft. If we allow the ideals of self-preservation to be the dominant form of consciousness, then all of our work is for nothing. An expanded suite of social protections requires a recognition of our shared struggle and a vision of empowerment. And the Triple C provides a pathway to do just that, integrating social service into the fabric of our society in a constructive and positive manner that produces net benefits for really all the parties involved. Now, ideally, this program is going to evolve as the needs of the nation evolve. And there's already examples, you know, we can learn a lot from organizations, for example, like AmeriCorps. But proper funding is going to be continuously needed to ensure that we have a genuine value generation for the participants um, and from the program itself. Right? And I think the core underlying theme of this argument is that all of us, myself included, we are all subject to a daily form of soul craft. It shapes the way we think and perceive in the world. It's reinforced by the institutions we inhabit, by the identities that we inherit at birth, and by the people and information that we surround ourselves with. So it's time for progressives to recognize that, that we can control this. It is within our power to direct and guide this consciousness forming structures. It's time for progressives to really embrace and recognize that we can control this. It is within our power to direct and guide these consciousness forming structures. It begins with changing ourselves, right? That's where it's gotta start in what we believe is acceptable in society. Bernie's civil conservation corps lay the foundation for a pathway to continued reinforcement of social consciousness within the United States. It connects us deeper to one another and solidifies bonds that are likely going to last a lifetime. The Triple C is an incredible policy and one that I encourage you to think deeply about when it comes time to cast your vote. Now, if you've been keeping up with national politics in the United States, you're probably already familiar with California Representative Katie Hill's recent resignation. Hill admitted to having a relationship with a campaign staffer, an issue that is against the code of conduct adopted by Congress last year, barring legislators to engage in sexual relationships with their staff. Now, prior to her resignation, the House Ethics Committee had announced a separate investigation into another possible relationship with a separate staff member that Ms. Hill denies. So there's, uh, there's the campaign relationship and then there's a, a current relationship. She's denying the current um, but she did admit to the campaign staffer relationship. And from a legal and social perspective, she made a significant error in judgment by allowing her romantic life to cross into her professional sphere. And like many of us, she's human and prone to error. Uh, from a political perspective, this is a huge loss for the progressive movement. Um, her history consists of successful nonprofit work focused on helping the homeless. Katie Hill won a tough primary and defeated an incumbent Republican to win her House seat. Um, and I'll link her wiki below so you can check it out in the details. She's earned an impressive resume within her short tenure uh, as a legislator. It really would have been better for the movement if she stayed, but her journey is, is taking her into a, a different direction now. And progressives in the progressive movement, you must we have to really be heralds of, of radical truth. In, in an age of blatantly corrupt Republicans and corporate controlled Democrats, the progressive movement provides a pathway towards a form of social service that begins and ends with transparency and honesty to the people that you know, we intend to serve. So with that said, we have to recognize that Katie Hill acted inappropriately for someone in her situation. And you know, there's an old adage, and it's, it's kind of crude, um, but there's truth to it, you know, don't shit where you eat, right? Unfortunately, progressives need to hold themselves to a higher account, and, and that might mean developing some standard form of ethics within our movement. It highlights a, a larger problem in the progressive movement that I, I talk about often in my local activism is, is that there's a lack of underlying structure. Progressives are battling two machines, the opposing Republicans and the corporate Democrats. All of these victories that we're earning are, are incredibly hard fought and we just can't afford to make amateur ethical mistakes. 
Now, one potential solution for developing local movements is to organize events to establish and reinforce best practices within the state, including lectures from legal professionals about what is and is not acceptable behavior in the public sphere. You know, if it sounds silly, it is, but Katie Hill's situation shows us that at our core, we're human beings and, and, our, and humans make mistakes, right? So um, unfortunately, her loss is a loss for the nation. Representative Hill was a rising star in the progressive movement, and now her seat is open to challenge from Trump Republicans. But Katie Hill's story goes beyond just poor judgment. The catalyst for her resignation was the leaking of nude photos from her ex-husband. In an act of revenge porn, the photos show Representative Hill nude, combing a st campaign staffer's hair, na and then there's another one, she's naked with a bong, and kissing the same campaign staffer in a separate fully clothed photo. So here lies our tragedy, right? Katie Hill's career was destroyed over actions that are very popular among a lot of people in the 40 and under demographic. As more progressives take up the mantle of fighting for a voice in the direction of our lives, we're going to face these issues again. Sending news has become a common practice and all that it takes is one deranged and petty individual to ruin a career. It's an egregious offense and one that all millennials should stand against. Um, Katie Hill has been public about saying her husband Kenny Haslop is to blame and according to BuzzFeed News that seems to be true. Um, Mr. Haslop was contacting news organizations and asking them if they wanted and I quote the whole story about Katie during their divorce proceedings. Now I certainly hope there's a full legal investigation but I'm going to avoid commenting on any possible outcomes. From Katie's perspective no one believes the person they love or loved deeply would betray them so much, right? Especially in such a public fashion. She left because she said she was essentially more worried that more compromising photos were going to emerge if she stayed in Congress. She feared, and I quote, what might come next and how much it will hurt. Uh, you know, so, I mean, that's, that's pretty devastating and that's really unfortunate. And it's since been released that Republican operatives we're behind the release of the nude photo leaks. Uh, so now our ideological divides have crossed this new threshold, right? One that can we can never go back from. Revenge porn has been used to attack a political uh, congresswoman. And will Katie Hill be the last politician to have their nudes leaked? No, most certainly not, right? So our work of infusing society with empathy, understanding, and intelligence continues. Every situation has a silver lining, if you know where to look. And in her resignation speech, Ms. Hill spoke about how she would dedicate her efforts towards fighting revenge porn and expanding legislation against it, which I think is a really worthy cause. Now, California already happens to have some very strict revenge porn laws, so I hope she pursues her assailants to the fullest extent of the law. They deserve to be punished. This is unacceptable behavior. To allow this to bleed into our political discourse and contests is unacceptable. Um, it's, it's personal moments, it, it, deeply damaging, uh, and just really unfortunate that um, someone would stoop to that level and, and just, you know, but that's, that's where we are, right? But, you know, this tragedy does present us new opportunities to right wrongs. The, this type of political gamesmanship and the releasing of new photos of an adversary should carry strict punishments. It does no good for us as a society and as a people to have this kind of stuff going on. And I hope that as we continue our evolution, there will come a day when, when something like this happens to someone, the reaction is one of, of tremendous and genuine support for the victim. Uh, one where you could imagine a system in another world in the future where Katie Hill wouldn't have to resign because the anger and outrage at her political opponents uh, and her ex-husband would far outweigh the, you know, the, the disgrace that comes with this kind of situation. Now, one thing I didn't mention, uh, I mentioned briefly that some people have taken issue with uh, her picture with the bong, right? She's smoking marijuana. Look, if you care about millennials smoking weed, you must be living under a rock at this point. Nearly every progressive millennial running for office supports the legalization of marijuana. When I ran for state assembly in New Jersey, it was a central part of my campaign. So, you know, perhaps if more boomers enjoyed the sacred plant, they'd have a bit more empathy towards others in the world. Um, our future leadership will smoke marijuana, and I think that's a good thing for society. Ultimately, our movement is worse off for losing Katie Hill uh, and her service in, in the House, but I imagine her role is, is not complete just yet. You know, recently, I, I read an article from Pew that they released this week. Um, Pew Research recently reported that 
Christianity is on the decline in the United States, and, and that's not surprising. Um, and I, I personally believe that's a, a great trend for our nation. Now, joining one of the major organized religions in the past was in, in many respects a requirement, right? I think we have to conceptualize that. Uh, for many people, church attendance was intertwined with social conformity. It was more important to be there than it was to embrace the religious convictions. What I would currently label as my favorite book is a book called The Religion of the Future by Roberto Mangiabera Unger. He's a philosopher and teaches at Harvard at the moment. And it talks in depth about the challenge with existing religious order. So religions have always tried to solve three problems, right? They've tried to address death. What happens when you die? Why do you die? Addressing a lack of purpose, usually through some sort of social order, right? So life is, is, is groundless for many people. There doesn't seem to be a lot of purpose, but this religious order provides a direction. And it also tries to address our desire for something greater. And, and all the religions, um, the Western religions, the Eastern religions, have tried to address it in, in, you know, address those three concerns in different fashions and in different ways, some, you know, succeeding more than others. But as the world has kind of become more interconnected and, and more and more people are, are finding their, their own path to purpose, right? They're, it doesn't, they don't need the structure of organized religion. And these paths, they're just not necessarily tied to the ideals of the past. Religious belief has dipped before, but it recovered in, in the United States. But I'm not so sure that can ever be the case again. There's a conflict of values between a growing sect of the population that believes in a pluralistic future and one that desires to stay bound to history. And I can't really imagine that gap closing as more people become more educated and more connected to one another through technology. Now, something for you to consider is that the spiritual and structure go hand in hand. This is why politics is such a passionate endeavor for so many people. Our institutional arrangements define our reality. They are the script that generates what we can and cannot do. What options we have in front of us and which are reserved for a select few all shape our perspective and what we know in the world. And they are the reason that we have a climate crisis. Our structure is the reason that we have decades of political actors owned by corporate interests is the reason that the United States has the largest wealth inequality in the world. You know, when it comes to politics and it comes to the spirituality of it, there are few causes that progress the human spirit as much as the direction of our shared future. So we'll see if this trend of religious decline you know, continues. I think it's a conversation for another day, but something to maybe you know, brain out about on your own time and we can revisit is, you know, what does the religion of the future look like? Uh, how do we tie a religious movement to the advancement of our structure and our collective society? How can we bind those two things? How do we democratize religion and spirituality in the form of manifesting it in a way where we create good into the world for the collective? Um, so it's, it's just a, an idea to consider. So, you know, again, we'll, we'll see if this, this trend of decline uh, continues. Now, we'll wrap up this episode with some new tech news from the week. CRISPR has been used to edit rice DNA as a defense against pathogens. Essentially, the bacterial blight that they wiped out would bind to proteins that transport sucrose, or sugar, right, across the rice cell membrane. Uh, they were otherwise known as SWEET, which is S-W-E-E-T. It stands for sugars will eventually be exported transporters. So the scientists went in and they edited the SWEET to, to see if it would stave off the bacteria. They focused specifically on the DNA sequences that were susceptible to the disease, but left the surrounding DNA intact. So it was a very concentrated, focused effort. It was a very deliberate attempt at, at altering this DNA. It's, it's far more specific than anything that could have expected to be occur in natural selection, like crossbreeding. Uh, the engineered rice was resistant to all known strains of the disease that they were testing against. Now, the scientists made a note in the report to say that although this is encouraging, and I think it is, I think it's very exciting, these results hardly provide a sound base for going out and planting this rice in the field. They need to do much more extensive field trials and they also want to complete the sequencing to ensure that the CRISPR did not generate any off-target DNA edits, right? I think when it comes to DNA editing and genetically modifying crops, we want to make sure that we don't release uh, you know, a terror into the wild uh, unknowingly. So I'm happy to hear that these scientists are doing their due diligence um, and, and another reason that you know, we have good reason to trust the scientists uh, in our society, our global society. 
these types of genetically modified foods are, are going to be an incredible milestone of progress for humanity. And I, I, one thing I don't ever get as a progressive, as a vegetarian progressive, right, someone who doesn't eat meat, I don't get the resistance to GMO crops. I, I think it's largely unfounded. And as we've been modifying our crops genetically for literally thousands of years. The only difference is now we have the power to do it in a fashion, so it's way more precise and way more efficient than ever before. GMO crops are how we solve world hunger. It's how we ensure that every human being on this planet is fed. Now, while I don't eat any meat, right, so I would naturally be avoiding GMO meats, even if you ate meat, I would understand the, the argument against eating, uh, eating GMO cow meat. However, I don't, uh, I'm looking forward to actually going back to meat when I can eat lab-grown meat. If, if for me, it was much more of an ethical issue um, and a moral issue uh, and, and a climate issue. And meat is the second biggest polluter. So that, those were my three kind of top things. Really, climate was first and then the moral and ethics. Um, but I'm, I have no morality about <laughs> eating lab-grown meat. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, but, you know, there's no reason for you not to be eating GMO corn or celery or carrots, whatever the case may be. We should embrace our advancement, not resist it. It's silly to resist change. Progress is speeding up uh, every year, and this is something we can observe. Okay, it's it's statistically true. We should not be ruled by fear and ignorance during the transition. We should embrace it. So, on that note, I think I'm gonna, that wraps up this week's episode of the Thinking Progressive Progress Report. Uh, once again, I'm your host, Ron Rivers. Thank you, as always, for tuning in. We'll see you next time. <music>